morning. Listen. The sower went out to sow the seed, and the seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. There are people who have every opportunity to hear the word. The religious folk have been to dinner with Jesus, have heard him talking in church, and yet they are unable to hear and experience the word in the dawning kingdom. They, from the beginning, question the activities of Jesus and begin plotting his destruction. So listen. A sower went out to sow and sowed some seeds along the paths, and the birds came and devoured it. Welcome to worship. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here. You're invited to join us and stop for a moment and listen for the word of God. Amen. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, the accuser immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Our focus scripture then is from Mark 11, 27 through 33. Again, they came to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask one question. Answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin? They were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as a, truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. right 
and your child on the left, and you have to kill one of them with your vehicle, which one will you choose? Needless to say, the discussion didn't go well because I basically told them it was a stupid argument and I would probably kill myself before I killed the child or the dolphin. <laughs> but I wanted to share that because in the scripture of Mark, and it, it occurs in all the other ones, but in Mark it's set up this way so that as Jesus is in Jerusalem, we... Uh, um, it's like hour after hour, this, the religious folk come up to him and ask him those kind of questions. Those kind of questions where there isn't really an answer, it's just a thought experiment, like what would you do? And so, one of the questions is, so, this lady got married, her husband died, she married his brother, her husband died, she married his brother, seven times she married his brother. In the resurrection of the souls, who is she married to? Another one came up and said, here's a coin. Do we have to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, who's on that coin? And so the argument was over whether we need to pay taxes as religious folk, and who do we have to pay taxes to. And Jesus' answer leads them to more questions, because what does he say? Give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God. So you could take that as, yes, pay taxes, or you could take that as, everything is God, so of course you're paying your taxes to God. But how that works out is not explained. How it's talked about is not explained. Again, another thought experiment. Another person comes up to him and asks, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus asks him, well, what do you think? Right? And then they talk about the greatest commandment being to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might to love your neighbor as yourself. This question, Jesus just doesn't leave with a challenge, but the man still walks away. In the Gospel of Mark, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious folk, so the ones who are deeply religious, they have a problem with how Jesus speaks about what he says and how he talks. And if you remember, just a couple weeks ago, we heard the very first encounter he had with the scribes. He is in the temple for the first time. He is reading and teaching, and they say, he teaches with one, with, like one with authority, not like the scribes. And that question of authority about why does Jesus do what he does runs throughout the scriptures of Mark with the question of does Jesus have the authority to do what he does and how he does it, right? Does Jesus have the ability? So the next encounter with the scribes is of a man who is lame and his friends have bought him to be healed and Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And they, he hears the grumbling inside, must have been pretty loud outside, and says to them, to show you that I have the authority, I tell you to pick up your mat and walk, for your sins are forgiven. They then encounter him again right after that incident because he's having dinner with people they don't think he should be talking to. He's eating with tax collectors and prostitutes. He's eating with drunkards and sinners. And they think that he isn't behaving the way a good religious person should be. And then they encounter him again on the way. And they ask him, why don't you wash your hands before you eat? You know, if you were a good Jewish person,
person. If you were a good follower of the traditions, you would wash your hands and your disciples would wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus talks about what makes somebody clean, what makes them impure, what makes them wonderful for God, beloved by God, and what leads them to not be beloved. And he said it isn't about how you eat or what you eat. It's about the things that come out of you, the words that you say, the emotions you express, the impact you have upon the world. And then things start to ramp up. And the next encounter he has with the scribes is he has just fed 5,000 people, right? And the scribes and Pharisees, the religious folk, come up to him and say, we need a sign that you are who you say you are. Okay, catch that, right? He has just fed 5,000 people and women and children. And the scribes and Pharisees, the religious folk, say, we need a sign that you have fed people. I mean, that you are from God. And then, then comes the questioning, the thought experiments about what it means to be a good Christian. And in this discussion, what we see is people who are on the path, right? These are people who have had every chance they could to learn about the kingdom of God. They've had every opportunity to experience the grace and wonder and mercy of God, to feel the love of Jesus in their midst. And at every opportunity, at every turn, at every thought experiment, they say no. They turn away from Jesus and away from the kingdom of God that he is sharing. Now, I do want to stop there for a moment and say, in the Gospels, the religious folk are used as the foil for Jesus, right? These aren't real Jewish people. These aren't real people who set out to destroy Jesus, and therefore we should hate all Jewish people from now and until eternity, okay? These were created as a foil to explain how people don't hear and experience the kingdom of God. Because right? if Jesus really thought that they were damned for eternity, would he spend so much time talking to them, inviting them into his community, eating with them, right? If he really thought that there was no hope, that they couldn't experience God, then he would have interacted with them. So when we think about the Pharisees and scribes, don't see them as a way to beat up current Jewish people, right? It's meant for us to say that there are always going to be people who hear the word of God and just turn away. They don't get it. They don't understand it. And there's some reason for that. And we don't know what that reason is, right? We don't know what it is that makes their path hard that makes those birds land and eat up the seed. We don't know what's going on with them. Because it could be that they are from one of the oppressed groups within the community, right? So let's take, for example, gay people. If you've gone to church your entire life and in that church you've been told that you are intrinsically evil and disordered and unworthy, at some point you say no to church, right? You turn off God because everything you've heard and seen and experienced about God has led you to the understanding that you have to either choose yourself or choose God. And so they have to choose themselves. But what are the other reasons people have for their path getting hard? For stopping and saying, 
no to God. For many people, it happens when a bad life event occurs to them, right? There's a death of a child. There's a death of a parent or a spouse. That death that they think could have been prevented sometimes leads them to give up on the entire Christian project and on God. They get hard. I think there are many other examples you could find of why people's paths become hard. So I thought this week we would look at the path that Van Gogh gave us, right? So that top picture over there is what it actually looks like, okay? The painting below is the, what he did. The top is the reality where you see a straight path leading through the wheat fields taking you towards the village and the trees, right? And then we have Van Gogh's interpretation of the path. And what do you see when you look at that painting? What do you experience in its presence? One of the things, and I've cut it off a bit so you can't really tell because it doesn't fit in the screen size. But in that painting, there are three paths. There are two here and there's one ahead. But what you notice about the paths is that they just end, right? Instead of like in the real thing, it, you can tell it goes on into and through the trees. In Van Gogh's painting, the path just stops. It's silenced and broken. The two side paths are just the hint that there is a path there without any destination or feeling that they go on. And this painting, which as Donna said on Wednesday, is very disturbing, and you could tell that it was made within the last months of his life before he committed death by suicide. But this painting, I think, really represents this image of the birds coming and eating the seed off of the path. Because what it says is that for the people who've heard the word, but for whatever reason they cannot hear it, their path has just stopped. It's been cut off. And those birds are flying agitated and extreme. But here's the thing. While the scripture about the path tells us how we're to look at the religious folk in this story. Because it says in the explanation of the parable that the ones who have their seed thrown upon the path have someone come and disturb it. The accuser come and mess with it and that leads them to give up on the word. But when Jesus says those words in the parable, listen, a sower came and sowed, and some of the seed was thrown on the path and the birds came and ate it. It doesn't say that that's the end. It doesn't say that those seeds will never see the light of day, will never find a home where they can blossom and grow and bloom. The parable doesn't say that that is the end and you are done. The parable leaves it open because the seeds are constantly thrown extravagantly over and over again. And one day, maybe you will hear the word. And instead of finding a path that's closed, you'll find a path that's open. You'll hear that you are loved and beloved and that the kingdom is now and here and ready for you. That the parable isn't meant to be an end. It's meant to be a beginning that opens you to the invitation to join in the kingdom of love.
invite you to close your eyes. And I invite you to breathe in deeply. I want you to picture the sower throwing out those seeds, those seeds of love towards you. Oh God, the seeds of your kingdom is forever being sown into our lives and our world. But it doesn't always take root. Sometimes it fails to find a place to grow. And so we pray for ourselves and others. When life makes us hard and resistant, like a well-trodden path, where old habits and old systems and old patterns of thinking keep your message from growing. There are times when we have stepped away from you, God, and let our faith fall away. We stopped reading your word, attending church, praying. We stopped practicing and just let it slide away. There are times when everything about our faith seems wrong, and we just turn away. The words are wrong. The welcome is wrong. The songs seem wrong. What we thought faith should be, what we thought faith does, doesn't seem present in church. And so we stop. We let it all be eaten by the birds. God, we pray for those who have lost their way. We pray for those who have pushed you aside. God, we rest here with you. We lift up our friends and family. Our friends who are ill, have had surgery, have fallen, and need your healing presence. We lift up the 500,000 who have died of COVID and the many more who will continue to catch it and die. We pray for all who are grieving. We lift up our healthcare workers and those who have more work, harder work, since this all began. We pray for those who have been left behind and left out of our economy. We stop here and pray. We pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our special mission offering goes to support Pilgrim Park. I'd like you to, to listen for a moment to some words that Mitch, the camp um, manager, shared with us this summer. Um, I've been doing this about 14 years, uh, helping host your summer camps and your retreat groups. And I can guarantee there's quite a few people on this, uh, uh, watching this video that, that have been out year after year, multiple times a year that uh, I've sort of grown up with, grown up around. And I, I consider you guys family, and I can honestly say that I, I miss you guys. I miss your faces. I can't wait until we can make it through this and we can have you guys back out for a visit, a cup of coffee, um, and just a quick conversation. Um, Pilgrim Park Church Camp in Princeton, Illinois, is a thin place for me, a place where my heart encounters God, where I experience the presence of the holy where I have made friends and laughed and fell in love. When I was young it was the camp where I spent my first overnight camp at. It was also the place where I encountered God 
in a real concrete first time way that has stuck with me ever since. I remember sneaking away from someplace, whether we were family camping or I was in camp, and making my way up to the cross at the top of the hill. And I crawled up on top of the cross, but there I was standing on top of the cross, and I could see everything. I could see the world laid out before me. I could see the sunlight as prisms and drops. And I knew that God was real and with me and present. Pilgrim Park is the place that gave me my first job. I ran into Bill Borden the other year at General Synod, and we reminisced about that first job I had at Pilgrim Park, about the people we knew together, about what I had learned about the antics of my brother. This morning, we have a chance to give our offerings to Pilgrim Park, to help them continue to thrive and survive. I hope that you will share the offerings that you have, that you will give generously to this place that has meant so much to so many over the years. Please give generously. So we celebrate our joys and the wonders of new life that is being born. Let us pray. God, we would grow with you. You bring so much fruit into being in our lives. God, we would grow with you and grow with those who experience the peace and wonder of the natural world and the community and fellowship that our church camp brings. Bless the food we have brought and the gifts we have given that we can continue to grow with you. Amen. today that I love you. Remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. And may you, in whatever place your path is hard and solid and rock filled, may that seed enter and grow and blossom and bloom. May you listen for the word of God. May the love of those seeds shine forth from your works and your acts and your words. Amen.